have some amazing rock star women with me here today, and I am so honored to be here. I'm Katie Payer. I'm part of the base camp team here at um, Denver Startup Week, and I'm just going to let these ladies tell you a little bit about themselves because they are going to do a far better job at their bios than I could ever. So um, I'm going to start with Annette to my left here. Annette, can you just give us about two minutes or so about who you are? Great. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's really a privilege to be here and talk with you all. And thanks for the initiative to be out here at um, Startup Base Camp. Um, I'm not really a startup. My business has been uh, in operation for about 23 years, and I run a an information technology services company and we started as an IT staffing company and over the years we've had to continue to reinvent, innovate and change up our business model to really be um, sh shifting with uh, the changes in the marketplace and what the demands are around that. And I um, am in business with my sister Victoria so we're a family owned business. Um, my we are. We were not. Uh, we didn't use like traditional type of uh, venture or angel capital to get started. So we have grown primarily through traditional bootstraps, bank debt, other kinds of, of money like that, and the reinvestment of our own uh, capital uh, in the business. We've had opportunities to, over the years, innovate around different offerings, including um, times where we brought uh, a bunch of folks in from overseas, from India, to meet some of our labor demands. A number of years ago, we had a Canadian subsidiary where we had about 1,000 employees that were working for us up in Canada. Um, we've done a number of different things with different partnerships, and so part of what I'm happy to answer any questions about are some of the challenges and opportunities associated with working with partners, working with family, um, how you manage your spouse or partner in the whole thing, because they might not be in your business, but they are every bit as much a part of your business. Um, right now, we are currently about a $10 million operation, roughly about 100 people. We're headquartered here in Colorado. We do uh, business in Wyoming, Montana, um, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, kind of a Midwest type of an operation for the types of customers that we support where we have employees. So thank you for letting me be here today. Thanks, Annette. I like the managing your spouse advice. That sounds like it could be some good yeah, stuff. Yeah. <laughs> when I get that one down, I'll let you know. But. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Um, I also want to briefly mention, if you're not able to join us for the entire thing, we are live streaming at youtube.com slash chase, so you could just keep watching. All right. Lauren, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Well, thanks, everyone, for being here and coming out today. Um, I'm a CEO of a company called PrimaTemp, and we're a company that's focusing on continuous temperature sensing and bringing that into the new century as a vital sign that's been overlooked. Our first product is uh, a device that a woman wears that continuously tracks her core body temperature, and it detects all the subtle changes that happen before ovulation. And when she's most fertile, it sends an alert to her smartphone. So the device is actually a, a cervical ring, just like all the other cervical rings on the market now that typically contain medication. So we took the medication out and we put a temp temperature sensor in. But uh, my path to this uh, position has been circuitous. Uh, I started life as a dancer and went all the way through becoming a dance major in undergrad and was auditioning on Broadway and wanting to be in Cats in a chorus line. And uh, back, the, back then, the, the Bob Fosse choreography was uh, trendy, and so they just kept telling me I was a good dancer and a good singer, but I was too short. So I went and I got my PhD in neuroscience, which is the <laughs> obvious next step. <laughs> And uh, spent many years in academia in Boston uh, with a laboratory developing treatments for Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. And then I moved into industry and was in San Francisco for many years at various biotech companies. And we were able to launch a few products. And then after that, I became a consultant, had my own consulting firm, and uh, worked with probably 40 different startups over the course of six years. And loved having my fingers in all Welcome different types of technologies, Week, working with lots of different types case. of entrepreneurs. Um, a little bit awesome of neuro, but then with, when uh, you become Chase a consultant, you go Bank, outside of your expertise. Really I worked with flu companies and diagnostic companies and vascular companies and fitness companies and was able to do everything from the science to the business to the investor side of things. So consulting really helped me just broaden my horizons in so many ways. 
And so with PrimaTemp, I started just consulting for them, had no intentions of joining any company full time because I like the Colorado lifestyle of flexibility. <laughs> and, uh, but within two months of working with PrimaTemp as a consultant, I realized they had all the boxes checked for an extremely successful company. So they asked me if I would consider being their CEO and I joined them full time in January. Uh, we just completed raising our Series A of over $1.8 million, and we should have Avuring on the market by early next year. So hope to tell you a little bit more about that whole pathway, and thanks again for being here. Great. Thank you, Lauren. If there's no audience questions at the end, I'm going to make you get up and dance. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tamara. Uh, I think I'm a little bit the anomaly here because I'm the CEO of a nonprofit organization, a 501c3 Women's Bean Project. But in many ways, we're similar in that... Um, we really are a lot like a startup organization, but we're a 25-year-old startup. And uh, my background is um, I have two science degrees, and then I became a marketing person in the for-profit world. Again, it makes total sense. And, um, and then um, I was volunteering at the Bean Project, and what I saw was that there was this business, and the better the business did, the more women could be impacted. And I was at a point in my career where I thought, you know what, I'd really love to do what I do, but feel like I was making a difference. And at the time I was um, consulting to large companies like American Express and Walmart, and there was just something inherently not satisfying about helping Walmart make more money. So I, um, I uh, started volunteering and the position of CEO came open and I was trying to talk my girlfriend into taking the job until finally she said, if you think it's so great, why don't you do it? And that, so that was a really big leap because to me, it felt it initially felt like going from the for-profit to the non-profit arena. But really, there are many similarities to working in small and startup kind of environments as there are in a non-profit because you're very bootstrapped and there aren't a lot of resources and they're just starting to be access to capital. Um, and it, but that's still very nascent. So we've um, accomplished a lot with a little and we have to be very creative. Um, in the 11 years I've been at the Bee Project, our sales have grown about 500%. And um, today we sell our products in over 500 stores in 40 states outside of Colorado. And we're ev in every Kroger store in the state. And in an odd twist of things, we're also working with Walmart.com. And so, uh, but all of that has really been about employing more women. So, uh, so our um, operating budget is about $2 million, and that really goes back into changing women's lives. We employ them for about nine months and then help them transition to career entry-level jobs in the community, which um, I believe makes the community better for all of us. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tamara. Thanks for being here. All right, Lauren. So I'm Jessica Adams. Hi, Joe. And um, I'm the founder of a company called Living Design Studios, and we do architectural and ornamental metalwork. And I thought I was the anomaly in the group. So we have two anomalies. My background has nothing to do with business, and my day has been like the uh, talking head song that says, how did I get here? Do you all know this song? So it's, what are the lines? This is not my beautiful home. This is not my beautiful wife or my dog. And I'm going, this is not my beautiful company. Like, how did I get here? And I'm really mystified. So 20-ish years ago, um, I started Living Design, but not a, I had no business plan. I had no money. I had simply what remains with me today, which is my passion for beauty, for artwork, for sustainability and partnership. And it was really, it's been a quest over these years of how do I infuse that into the world, into my life, and work together to, to turn that into a business. So I started, um, I borrowed tools from a friend 20 years ago to create an art piece that I made on the floor of my bedroom. It was an embossed copper sculpture. I gave it to a realtor friend who posted it on the wall, hung it on the wall of his office. He sold a big piece of real estate, and the people he sold it to, um, he wanted to thank them for their big commission to him. He commissioned to me a piece that he gave to them, brought me with him. They decided, hey, she's got some talent, let me have her line the walls of our, our, our pool in copper. So that was then my, my second job. But I couldn't do it on my own, I didn't have the right tools, so they actually paid for my tools. I got $8 an hour, which I thought was great, because no one would care how long it took me. <laughs> and, um, and I needed help, so I hired someone. 
that same client was quite thrilled with um, the outcome of their project and they went on to buy a resort in the mountains and renovated it and had me do all the ornamental metal work there and then as people began to stay in the resort they started calling and finally I got a studio and I had a studio for a few years before I had a phone and then I got a phone and then eventually someone asked me for a business license and I said oh I need that and went and got one the next day and so all of this is to say I didn't know what I was doing. I knew what I loved. And I really learned as I, as I went. And so fast forward to today, we have an extraordinary staff of 21 people. Um, I have an extraordinary business partner, which is why I didn't call myself the CEO, because we really run the company together. Um, we have 12,000 square feet. This year, we're going to produce in the neighborhood of $3 million of architectural and ornamental metalwork. About half of it is in private residences, and about half of it is available to all of you. It's being installed at the Denver airport right now in that big renovation project. It's in, um, it's in some of the new light rails that are going in. It's on the sides of highways, and uh, it's in the judicial center around the corner. And if you are into high-end shopping. You can see some of it in Beverly Hills and Miami, and we're kind of all over. Great, Jessica, thank you so much. So I noticed that two of you, Tamara and Jessica, used the word anomaly, and, and one of my questions actually was gonna be, do you all still feel like anomalies in the startup space, in the business space as leaders? You know, a lot has changed in recent years with women-owned businesses and whatnot, and we kind of got a taste of that from one of our keynote speakers on Monday at the kickoff breakfast. But I'm curious, besides feeling like an anomaly maybe here in this group of four, do you feel like an anomaly in the business space in general? I can answer yes. Because I had this conversation with my partner before coming. And I said, I was reading about this panel discussion and it said, you know, women entrepreneurs. And I thought, I don't, that's not how I think of myself. I don't think of myself as an entrepreneur. It's not, um, I suppose it is what has happened, but that's not how I label myself. So yes, would be my answer to your question. And by the same token, I would say that I don't label myself as a nonprofit executive. I run a business that has a mission and social enterprise that um, happens to be a 501c3, but we, and we make food products, um, and we can't exist without it, but we don't exist to do that. We exist to change women's lives. So in every, sort of every angle, we're kind of an anomaly. Well, following on Jessica's point, when she said she doesn't think of herself as a woman entrepreneur, the entrepreneur side, I've always been of the mind that don't call me a, a woman executive or a woman entrepreneur, just call me an entrepreneur or an executive. So I've always been, with all the years that I've been in biotech companies, I've always or most often been the only woman in the boardroom or the only woman in the executive group or the only woman. And, and I've never thought of that as an anomaly. I've kind of thought of that as a little bit of a plus because for the first five minutes, they would see me as a woman, but as long as you go in there and you do your job and you do your job well, within five minutes, they should stop looking at you as a woman and just look at you as a colleague. So I try not to use the whole woman CEO um, too often, although we still do have some challenges, so. So I'm gonna answer this from the point of view of the technology space, and um, what I'll say is that um, there just aren't as many women in technology as men. And so in that way, it still feels a little bit like an anomaly. And I have a degree in chemical engineering, and I have the privilege of having two daughters in college. And so one of them's up at CU Boulder getting her degree in computer science. The other one's at CSU in engineering. What, what I will say is that as much as I would have hoped that things would have changed from when I was in school up, at, up there in terms of the balance or proportion of women getting degrees in technical and engineering fields, it really hasn't changed at all. And so when I look at their experiences, even as they enter the workforce, um, you know, my daughter worked for um, a data, um, big data company in Seattle, and it's, you know, 80% men still there. And uh, she's there as an intern. My other daughter worked in construction for a big commercial construction company, the only woman on the job site. And so, so yes, I think things are changing, and it's great to try not to think of yourself as, you know, a, an anomaly, and yet there's the reality of sometimes of the work environment that really kind of gets in your face about that. Thank you. And kind of going off what you were saying, Lauren, with the challenges, and, and maybe you, you all can jump in, 
when you're not necessarily treated as an equal and they're still looking at you as just the woman in the room, how do you handle that? I think sometimes you can use it to your advantage. You know, um, I, I often joke that nobody wants to make the nonprofit girl cry. So, like, well, how bad would you feel? You know, so, so you, you know, you can, you can, you can leverage some things in, in ways that you, you know, might not necessarily think initially. My, my experience with that is, um, so I'm, I would say now that I'm in the construction industry, as you yeah. described, which is primarily male. Um, I have experienced minor comments, things that, you know, there's things that could be construed negatively. Sometimes I took them as compliments, sometimes not. Um, I don't know that there's an exact way to handle it. I think for me, what I really realized was I'm there to do a job, I'm there to do it well, and if I'm meeting my standards as to the criteria of that, then generally I find that everyone is on board pretty quickly. I'll just add that I think, um, okay, so this is probably my baggage, um, working in environments where there's a lot of men and smart men. You know, in technology, you've got really smart guys. And I generally think that they, I assume I'm, I need to somehow prove that I know enough to be there. And so I put a lot of pressure on myself personally to make sure I do my homework. I'm well informed before I go into meetings that I just try not to create any opportunities for someone to look at me and go, you know, what are you doing here? I, I agree. And that goes back to what I said, just go in there and do your job and do it really well. And don't cry in the boardroom. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Donald Trump saying that on The Apprentice. Right. <laughs> There's no crying in the boardroom. And if you're a woman, that goes double. <laughs> but I have had a couple instances where We'd be in a meeting, we were all at equal level, and someone would say, Lauren, can you go get, a, get the coffee? And so, well, of course, our first reaction is they're asking me to get the coffee because I'm the woman, but we do have to kind of take a step back and say, well, did someone else get the coffee last time? Is it really? But if it is potentially frank, uh, sort of woman-specific uh, language, I will literally, with a big smile on my face, call them out on it. And I will literally say, did you just say that out loud? <laughs> it's 2014. Let's all go get our coffee together. And if you say it with a smile on your face, sometimes they, they get the message. But it's a lot less offensive than if you, you know, got really upset and offended or, or repressed it and, and vented with someone else. So call them out if it's obvious, uh, but do it in kind of a fun way so you can laugh about it. <laughs> Great. I, can I add one thing on this, which is, for better or for worse, I actually specifically on construction sites don't let people know that I'm the owner of the company because I want people to treat me according to, again, the value that I'm providing. And it's a little bit for me of a litmus test at all times. How, how are women on the job site being treated, period, regardless of their roles? And it's really important to me that, that um, it's not because of the position that I have. It's just because of the, the work that I carry. Do your job, do it really well. Yeah. I love that. So kind of in light of that, and because it's Women Crush Wednesdays, I would love to hear about each of your biggest personal, or let's say business actually, biggest business challenge and how you overcame it. Well, I think <laughs> when I first started at The Bean Project, um, it, was it was coming out of a financial crisis. And, um, and so I... I don't think I realized that I was going in to be the turnaround CEO, but that's what I ended up becoming. And there were times when, the, the good thing about going into a situation like that is that everybody knows what staying the same looks like. And, the, and you know, they realize that they don't want that. So you can, as a change agent, you can implement lots of change pretty quickly, relatively speaking. But at the same time, you know, I was making decisions and I was, you know, choosing certain direction or action. And really all I had was the courage of my conviction. I had no idea if it was going to actually work. And, but, you know, that's what being the leader is about, is, you know, deciding, taking in the data and deciding what you think is the right path and then, you know, and then having the fortitude to pursue it. And so I, I think that that, 
was a really early lesson in this job and has served me very well. Um, and so it also, I, it means that I need to make sure I have the right information to, in order to make those decisions, that I'm not making them in a vacuum. But I think that that's probably um, uh, one of the most important you know, attributes that I needed to develop and I've used over and over again. Great. I feel like, so over the 20 years that I've been doing this, there's been an incredible number of challenges. Um, I think my early biggest one was, an early vision of mine was to have an entirely female metal fabrication shop. And so we got up to the point of six women building, fabricating, building, installing our metal work. And at a certain point, five of the women, we had just hired one guy, um, so one man, so five of the women left together to start a competing company. <laughs> and um, that was extremely difficult. So it was myself and, and one man who had been there three months, I'm guessing. For me, I would say, as I look back at all the challenges, they're, they're my greatest teachers. Um, you can milk them for 20 years for what can I learn, how have I changed, what am I doing differently. That was my greatest teaching on how do you treat your staff, how do you lead your staff, how do you inspire your staff, how do you make their meaning um, to the company really, really clear and obvious. And, and that's one of, when I talk about sustainability, that to me is part of sustainability. If you don't have an incredible staff who's completely committed to the vision of the company, you're not a sustainable company. Well said. Um, I'll answer this. One of the most challenging times uh, for us was right after 9-11. And we had been running a very successful IT services company, which we leveraged um, all of the receivables and the assets of that company to move into the contact center line of business. And we built out a big facility in Canada that was about 50,000 square feet. It's very, very expensive to do that. And we entered into about a $3 million um, credit facility on that, and then 9-11 hit, and all of our business and our IT services part of the company just went through the floor, and I'm sitting on this big debt, and w really having to navigate our way through this at a time where it was just really, really tenuous, and we were lucky in that we landed, I would say lucky, we worked really hard too, a landed um, a, a customer that very quickly provided about, I don't know, $14 million worth of annual revenue that was able to really help us out. But one of the lessons for me also had to do with the relationship with my husband. Because what happened is that when I, I've handled all the banking relationships for our company for a long time, and we had uh, lines of credit that we never used. You know, you have them available if you need them, but we had a lot of our own retained cash, and so we were very conservative. And so when I went to negotiate this arrangement, I personally guaranteed this note so that I could save the company about $40,000 worth of fees, thinking, oh, it's never going to happen. They're never going to have to come after my house. And then at some point later, my husband and I, it's one of these Saturday mornings talking in bed, and he's like, hey, how's it going? And I'm like, I need to tell you something. And, and he's like, you did what? For how much money? Like three million? I mean, that's like our house. That's like everything that we have. And then it just completely blew up. And his friends are saying, you need to divorce her. I mean, it was like really serious. And so we made it through all of that. It was really, you know, it's not easy. And, and remedied all the financial stuff and everything. But my big lesson about that is that as much as your husband's not in at work all the time and they're not involved in the business plan, they are very, very much a part, sort of a sideline partner in what really happens with the business. And so now I have learned to be a lot more communicative <laughs> about even things like that and it's, it's just been a really important, important lesson. That's a good one to learn, personal and professional. Lauren, did you have anyone you want to share? Um, gosh, that one is <laughs> heartbreaking, <laughs> but I'm glad you made it through. Yeah. That's that's incredible. Didn't to get the time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've hit a bunch of walls throughout my uh, career. I mean, the you know, I'd spent all of my life dancing, and that was what I was going to be. And then after so many months, it just wasn't going to happen. So. I had to make the decision and be open-minded about going into something else, become a scientist. And then 
I was in academia for many years and it just wasn't feeling right. So rather than stay in it, I kind of opened my mind beyond what a scientist should be thinking and went into industry. And then when that wasn't really moving as well and I was just starting to get uncomfortable with where my career was going, I made the switch to consulting. And, and so I had to learn each one of those decisions actually um, was slow in coming, but when it actually came time to make the decision, I went with my instinct. And you have to trust your instinct. And maybe that is one aspect of being a woman that is maybe stronger than men, uh, is just this internal instinct of something's not right here. And it may be a maternal thing or a spousal thing, or it probably seeps into all aspects of our lives. But if something doesn't feel right, or if your job doesn't feel right, if, if the ethics of a company doesn't feel right, take a step back and don't be afraid to just go on to something else. Because you can always go back to what you were working on. You can always change gears again, but don't be afraid to take the leap, uh, especially if something just doesn't feel like it's completely fulfilling you. Trust yourself. Yep. I like that. How do you all feel about mentors? Do you have mentors? And if you have a mentor, is your mentor a female or a male? And you know, kind of how do you how did you find that person? Tell me about your mentor story if you have one. Lauren, you're not I have great ones. <laughs> um, coming right out of academia, I was this neuroscientist who had been in the lab working in petri dishes and publications and grants. And when I moved to um, a pharmaceutical company in San Francisco during the dot-com boom, I mean, it was the most exciting time to be in industry and biotech. And I was so green. But the CEO of the company that hired me um, took me under his wing and was just phenomenal. He, he knew I was basically a scientist, but he took me to every business meeting. He took me to meetings with potential partners. He took me to FDA meetings, he took me, and it was because I gave him the, um, uh, the statement that I wanted to learn more than I knew. And so you have to sort of identify mentors who are willing to mentor you, but you also have to give them the signals of everything that you want to learn, because they, they won't know that. So I said to him when I joined the company, okay, I'm a good scientist, but I want to learn everything there is about business and biotech and what you do and what he does and what she does. And so when he heard that, he said, okay, get ready because I'm taking you to every single meeting. And I loved it. But you have to not only identify those people, but give them clear signals that you want to learn specifically what you want to learn. And most people who are successful, they really want to pass it on. So be aggressive with them, I guess. Well, I was lucky that I I sought out through initially like within the first six months uh, that I was in business a program through the SBA that hooked up uh, women uh, in business with other women in business, and then about five years later I had another mentor. And I don't know if I got the luck of the draw or what, but um, I made a point of finding mentors that had been in business that were in like businesses, and that really helps a lot. And then I ended up with women mentors who were tough. So both of them, when I first sat down with them, basically said, hey, I want to help, but, and this is, you know, my way of giving back, do not waste my time. Do not waste my time. They were really direct about it. So if you want me to mentor you, you get organized, you tell me what you need, you do your homework, do not waste my time. And it was like kind of scary, actually. That's how it felt to me. And yet it was one of the most useful pieces of advice that I got because I thought, wow, this is really serious. I mean, their time is, is really valuable and I need to take this seriously as well. So I feel like I'm only here because of the mentor that I had. Um, at the time when I was borrowing tools and, and crafting things on the floor of my bedroom, I was also a nanny for a family. But I specifically became the nanny for that family because the mom was the CEO of a company. And I knew, I thought, you know what, if I'm around her and if I can just absorb and be kind of her stalker, then I can <laughs> learn about what she's doing. And it was sort of a semi-conscious decision at, at that time. But she pushed me and continues to push me incredibly hard about, you know what, the way you're thinking about this is entirely wrong, which has turned out to be true for m most things. <laughs> and specifically, like, this is a story you guys will appreciate. I remember arguing with her, like, 
this makes me, this dates me. But anyways, I was like, we're in the yellow pages. If people want to find me, they can. I don't need to market. And so this, you know, and this was, I had been doing it for five years. And I was convinced, like, this is how closed-minded I was and that, that marketing was unnecessary. And I feel like without a mentor, you can't see beyond your own thinking. So I encourage everyone, you've got to get mentors and you've got to get people that push you hard because um, my, one of my lessons and one of my, what I pass on to all of you is it's your own thinking that's your biggest limit. You've got to have someone who expands that. Well, I think the best lesson I've learned from a mentor is um, when I try to make the case for, no, but we're different, he'll say, you know, you're not that special. <laughs> there are lots of other people who have these problems. And that, you know, but that's good because it gets you out of your own head and it gets you realizing that you can learn something from others as opposed to thinking, well, you know, our problem's very unique. It, you know, no one else has probably had this problem exactly the way we're having it. And just to sort of bring me down and say, sorry, <laughs> you're just not that special. You're not that unique. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So sounds like some amazing people that you've gotten the chance to work with. Let's kind of flip it. And if you had the chance to mentor a younger woman who was starting up a business or who was taking on a leadership role in a business, what advice would you offer her? And maybe it's one or two pieces of advice. And that I know you might have one or two. Go ahead. Okay. I actually thought a little bit about this. Um, and so a couple of things, um, especially when Three things. One is, especially when you're a startup, it's really, really important to know your strengths and weaknesses. And the reason for that is that um, you tend to, to do the things you like and are easier for you, and it doesn't, and, and probably not do as much of the stuff that either you don't like or you don't really feel like doing or you don't know enough about. And because as a startup entrepreneur, you represent so much of the character and, and um, stuff of the company that when you don't acknowledge your blind spots or really work to know what they are and shore them up, um, your whole business is at risk because of it. And, and so I would encourage you to really be aware of that and look at, like in my case, a um, couple of things. I wasn't really particularly good with the finances. So, I mean, I could understand the the numbers, but I wasn't really great with the finances, and I had to bring, in, my, in this case, my sister in who had worked for a bank, and she was a lot better about the details and was able to help with that. Um, so that's part of it. Um, the second thing I would just like to recommend is that um, this whole question about partners in your business can be as hard as being married, if not more difficult. I mean, all of the reasons that being married to somebody or in, a, in an intimate relationship can be difficult are the same reasons that partnerships in business can be very, very difficult. And so there's all the stuff that you think you talked about and that are going to pertain to the, to the relationship and you're all on the same page, but like a typical thing where relationships can be... Um, you don't talk enough about it is, for example, you might have a partner that you're in business with and you go, yes, we both love the concept and the vision for the company. But you don't take it far enough to go, well, my vision is that my, I'm betting my whole financial future on the success of this company. So one partner is saying, I'm going to do everything I can possibly do to make sure this is successful. I'm going to work all the hours. I'm going to, I'm going to like just put everything I've got into it. Then you got another partner that's there that's saying, I love this business. This is a great idea. But you know, I already did that 20 years ago. And so, so I'm in, but not like that. And that's the stuff that can really create a lot of friction. Likewise, is even as the business starts to get more successful, you've got the one entrepreneur that's saying, hey, we're making money. Let's put it back into the business. You got the other one in the partner that's going, seriously, when do I get paid? And so these are the things that become really, really hard in, in the partner relationships. And they don't even need to be like a legal partnership. They're the people maybe that you're that are just there that you're relying on. So being able to have those kinds of conversations is really, really important and, and hard too. I would add to your comment about knowing what you're not good at is that um, get good quickly at building a team and don't find team members, whether they're partners or otherwise, who are just like you. Because that doesn't do you any good in the long run is to have everybody, you know, 
in the in the room agreeing with you because they think the same way you do. It's better, I think, to have people who are going to challenge you, and um, in in the long run, you're it, it's it's going to be healthier for the company. So one of my favorite sayings is, um, "Experience is the result of many years of not having it," and. This was told to me early on, and I think one of the, like if I were speaking to a young woman who was starting something up, I would say you just, there's no way around just doing it and messing up and correcting and learning and there's no right way and, um, and, and know that it's going to be a challenge and know that you could never prepare yourself for all the challenges. But if you have the right team around you, eventually, you know, if you, if you have, I think the right team is probably the, the most important key, but you can get through it. Um, there was another piece I was going to add, and it is slipping my mind. It'll come back. Why don't you go ahead? Well, one thing that I've learned from every company that I've been in and even when I was still in academia is sometimes not making a decision can paralyze your company. And so I heard a quote um, a few months ago that uh, this was at, the, um, at a, a conference on startups and women in startup companies that you get 10 points for making a good decision, you get zero points for making a bad decision, and you get negative 10 points for not making a decision. So as startups, we have to keep moving and iterating. And I mean, it's the whole lean startup. But when it comes down to your day to day, you go into the meeting. And at the end of the meeting, you should say to everyone in the room, what decisions did we make today? And you should have some decisions made every single meeting, whether they're weekly or monthly or daily. So it can paralyze a startup company. And I've seen it so many times. So just make the decision. And if you fail, you fail. But at least you're moving in one direction. And that's forward. Great. Jessica, did you think of your other pearl of wisdom? I think so. <laughs> what I would say, my experience, and I think I've heard you all reiterate it, is you never stop starting up. It's not like you start up and then you're done. You start up and you go for a little while and you continue to start up and your challenges that hit you are, are, are again, the next startup version. So um, we're experiencing that in our company now. And how are we going to start this one up? And, and this is the 10th, 12th, 20th time we're starting up, so to speak, because you hit a new challenge, maybe it's positive, maybe it's negative, but how are you going to reinvent? How are you going to make that work? How are you going to partner with the rest of the community around you and, and rock it out? Great. So what's next for all of you? What, what does the next starting up look like for you, Jessica, and the next phase of things? How about five years? What does that look like for all of you? Well, okay, so I can answer this easily because I was just talking about it. So the startup that we are facing right now is we have more work than we can produce. Our doors are getting knocked down by people needing architectural ornamental metal work. We cannot find the staff. We cannot, so, so what are we, how are we going to handle that? What's the startup of that um, fabulous problem to have? Um, we have reached out to our slash competitors who are really also our partners, other ornamental metalworking companies, and we're trying to start what we're calling a resource share. So we all have the same issues. We all have days that materials are supposed to arrive and they don't, and you've got a staff of 10 people with nothing to do. So what if we can borrow their guys for 10 days? What if they can borrow our guys for 10 days? What if our material rise damage and they have it sitting on their shelves? Like how can we all team together to keep this business local because Denver is exploding in the construction industry and the whole front range. Um, so that's kind of, that's one of our startups right now. How do we be really smart and savvy with the issue that every metal company is dealing with right now? Great challenge. Yeah. Anyone else want to talk about the future? <laughs> well, at our current capacity, and it's based, for us, sales create jobs, just like any other business. So we won't hire women to teach them the skills that they need if we don't have the sales to support it. And our current capacity, we turn away four out of five qualified applicants. And to be a qualified applicant, you have to have been chronically unemployed and impoverished, which means that typical woman we hire wouldn't have had a job longer than a year in her lifetime, and the average age is 38. So if you think about that, that's a lot of women in our community who who need 
um, to change their lives. So what we've, we've grown through product sales. We have two manufacturing businesses. One makes gourmet food products, the other handmade jewelry. And we've really um, grown incrementally and increased the number of women we employ based on that. But I realized recently that maybe we've taken the hard road because if you look at our peer organizations across the country, we're the only ones that have chosen consumer products. And a lot of them have, have um, instead done local service companies like pest control or cleaning or um, landscaping. And what if we were to start providing a service and that would be to do peace work for others and to do fulfillment for others because we have a very robust fulfillment process and um, technology. And that really, it's not about our product, it's about doing the work for others because ultimately what we're about is creating jobs because we know when we hire a woman, we can change her life. So it, for us, it was thinking a little bit differently about if, if the end goal is to hire more women, then maybe we can do that in a different way. And it doesn't have to be dependent on these consumer products that, that we have historically really confined our thinking to. Oh, that's fantastic. I love hearing that. So if anyone needs peace work, please call. Uh, I need peace work. <laughs> so... Uh, so now I'm realizing I'm sort of the odd man out up here in that we are the only company up here that doesn't have a product on the market right now. So we have no revenue. We don't see revenue in our near future. We're, we'll have our product out early next year. but uh, So we're still in really early uh, startup phase. So to look five years down the line is a little far, although I can say by then Apple will have purchased my company and I'll be on my eighth startup by then. But, <laughs> but a year from now, we, we really want to grow the company um, have some revenue, gain some sales traction to show that women who are trying to conceive really need a product like this and women are comfortable enough with technology that they can bring technology and wearable sensors into their life for something as intimate as conceiving a child and that's not an astronomical idea and we've already got interest from Samsung and Apple and Roche and Merck and Aetna and those companies but uh, the short term is to really prove that uh, humans are ready for wearable sensors in all aspects of their lives. And so that's the goal, really. Maybe you'll need piecework help if it gets okay. crazy demand. Great. So for our company, we've got two principal uh, lines of service, and one of them is in the area of hosted interactive voice response systems, which we provide those services to the cable sector. And we have the unique... Um, privilege and opportunity and challenge to have the two largest cable companies in the country who are both our customers merging and um, to really figure out what that's going to mean to us. And so within that line of business to also look at how we transform what we're doing um, in that area of hosted integrated voice response to be fully multi-channel support for contact management, including, including text, um, voice, email, mobile, the whole channel model. So that's part of the vision. Um, on our managed services side, which is where we manage different organizations, technology, um, we need to continue to evolve our offerings to include a lot um, stronger offerings in the whole security area because that's, I think, becoming, has been and is becoming so much more consistently a challenge for different organizations to manage, for one. And secondly, um, how we begin to bridge, how we go about managing technology to more fully embrace how mobile devices are included in that model. Wonderful, amazing work you all are doing. I'd love to open it up to questions from the audience if anyone has anything to ask any of these amazing women. I don't know if we have a mic. Um, so I was wondering, uh, I don't want to assume anything about your masculinity and femininity, but I was wondering if um, kind of the people you work with expect you to be especially feminine or masculine, or if you have like a moment where it's a little bit more one way or another, they're like, I don't, I don't know what to do with this. So just sort of curious how people respond to that. Their, their gender expectations, let's call it that. <laughs> kind of goes back to going and do your job <laughs> and <laughs> I it's interesting because we're right now we're a women's health company we're not really always going to be a women's health company but we're seen as a women's health company with fertility and it's myself and the whole rest of the company are men 
it's a lot of engineers, and there just aren't as many female engineers, and we're working to change that. But um, And I, I just think during meetings even with um, when things get a little hot in the room or, or uh, when we hit some problems, women just go about solving problems differently than men or discussing them differently than men. And um, sometimes that's a pro and sometimes that's a con. So having men and women in the room, I think, can provide a really good balance. And sometimes we're all more masculine and sometimes we're all more feminine in the room. But um, they can both be pluses at different times. So. What I would say if I was your mentor, because I'll answer it a little differently. This is what I've been told. You want to ask the question, how do you want to be treated? It doesn't really matter how people treat you. Because as a woman, as any entrepreneur, as anyone in business, your job and capability is to, is to lead everyone around you. So even if someone treats you like crap, you can teach them to do otherwise. And I really believe, you know, for, for, for any of us in, in, and it doesn't matter if you're the owner or, or part of the staff, we train our staff to say, hey, look, if we're doing something that doesn't sit right with you, tell us. Like, we all grow on feedback. So you can present, if, someone, if something's going on and it's not right, you can present feedback and say, hey, this is, this is what I see, and you don't want to be like that, and you can do better, whatever it is. You know what I'm saying? So I think... One of my great learnings is, what's, what's the question? What's, what's a good question for you to focus on? You know what I mean? I, I would answer um, it this way is that, um, moreover, it, mostly, whether you're a man or a woman, it really is important for you to feel like you can be yourself. Because if somehow or another you think you need to show up in a way that isn't, you can't really be authentic about, then it, it, everybody knows. It becomes really, really obvious. So t really get in touch with yourself. Look at the ways that you communicate. Ask some of the good questions about maybe how you can be more effective or more clear. But moreover, really lean into your strengths and be yourself because then I think whether you're a man or a woman, you're going to be more effective. Any other questions? So just repeating the question, there's an 80-20 split between males and females in construction. What's the cause? Oh, sorry. And IT. There we go. This is just my opinion. I think um, young women are not oriented early enough in their education, which is probably around middle school, to um, around math and science and technology and things like that. And I think, this is just my opinion, there are unconscious biases that sometimes our educators have that some somehow in some cases don't reinforce or encourage um, young women to take classes in those areas. Sometimes girls aren't reinforcing of each other and supportive of each other around some of those choices. And so I think it goes way early into um, how they're being educated and, and what kinds of things are being talked to about that can either get their interest and motivation to be making those choices or point them in another direction. And that's where the STEM program is really coming totally. from. So we look forward to seeing what that looks like 10 years from now, if the STEM programs have really changed those, those numbers. Any other questions? I just have one quick follow-up, because this got brought up last night in Women Who Start Up is investing in programs. You're kind of talking about building towards the future and how can you invest in those programs today so that 10 years from now this all looks a little bit different. Do you, in each of your individual companies, look towards organizations that will help change that makeup 10 years from now? There's an organization called Springboard Enterprises that I would encourage all of you to look into. It's a, it's a mentorship program, but they also provide incredible connections. But it was uh, initiated by the woman who started um, the USA Channel and the Sci-Fi Channel. So remember how long ago that, that was one of the first two cable channels, really, as cable started to develop besides the network channels. So she was in this world um, 20... 
30 years ago as an executive, and she went through some rough times just being a woman. And so she, once she became successful, she started Springboard Enterprises, and my company has been a part of it, and it is the most incredible um, mentorship program, but also connecting us, like I said, with potential partners to not just teach us how to be stronger executives, but also how to make our company successful so that there are more successful women-led companies. And that's what inspires the girls. So I'll just answer this by saying both my sister and I, my business partner, um, really regularly mentor other women in starting their businesses. So we try to do what we can kind of on a one-on-one on, one by one person at a time type of a basis. The other thing is that my husband and I personally have gotten involved in helping to um, donate and help fund the startup of the Education Foundation for the Colorado Technology Association. And this basically said the this ed, uh, industry association doesn't need to replicate what um, education is doing. There's a lot of people that are working some of the STEM issues on, on that side. But there is a need to be able to more effectively bridge the young people that are coming out of our educational environment into industry here in Colorado. We have unique challenges in Colorado in, in the Denver area that we've got a lot of startup and, and smaller businesses, but the challenge is that a lot of those businesses are just not well suited because they don't have big enough HR organizations and all that to be able to come up with good internship programs, to manage interns when they're there, to be dealing with all the stuff, chasing around the universities to find good interns. And so CTA has a really important role that it can play in this education foundation is going to be really focused on that so that's one of the ways that that I'm involved great I think we've got time for one more question if we have one no more all right well thank you ladies so so much for joining us we appreciate you taking your time out of your very busy lives to come share your thoughts with us this has been a wonderful Thank you all for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day at Denver Startup Week.